Hello, folks. This is Joe with a very special announcement. On Friday, September 21st, I'll be hosting the Trap Set Live with special guests Rod Argent and Colin Blundstone, founders of one of my all-time favorite bands, The Zombies. After the conversation, Rod and Colin will play an ultra-rare, all-acoustic set of timeless classics. It all takes place at Ace Hotel in Palm Springs, California. This is an intimate performance and space is limited. Don't miss out on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Visit acehotel.com slash zombies for ticket information. I feel like I'm pretty good at, at bringing people together. Now, keeping them together, maybe not, <laughs> not, the, not the best at that. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing Never Be Alone by the Get Up Kids, featuring my guest, Ryan Pope, on drums. Formed in Kansas City in 1995, the Get Up Kids were rooted in the ethos of punk rock and students of classic pop songcraft. Ryan's metronomic groove and innovative rhythmic hooks helped the band become one of the most influential to emerge from the Midwest during the 90s. The Get Up Kids ended their initial run in 2005, and Ryan continued to record with bands such as Kofax and Reggie in the Full Effect. He also became a serial entrepreneur. Now reunited, Ryan and the Get Up Kids are currently working on their sixth album. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. Now my conversation with Ryan Pope. We would always go to the city. Mm -hmm. We did our best to get out of Olathe. And for folks that don't know, your brother Robbie is a bassist that you've played with for your whole life. My entire life. And and is he older or younger? He's one year and two days older than I am. Oh, nice. And I have a twin sister. Oh, you do? Yeah, so um, my mother was quite busy. Quite prolific. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Is your sister a musician too? She plays piano. Um, not professionally or anything, but she, she's, she's a pretty good piano player. Was it just the three of you kids? I I have an older brother also. Older, older than your, older than, uh, Robbie. Yeah. He's four years older than I am and he lives in Seattle and has four kids. Holy cow. And is a really good piano player actually. Did you play piano before you played anything else? I did. That so was, that was the program in the house. That was the program. Um, that was the... Uh, it wasn't even an option. It was like when we were, I think, I was seven years old. It's yeah, like, me too. Like when I was six, I did mm-hmm. piano. Yep, like right... At, and I'm really, really glad that my, my parents did that. Um, I wish I would have stuck with it more because now it's like you go back and you're like... Oh, why didn't I, you know, put in the work to really learn at that younger age when you you can absorb that information so much easier? Yeah, it's weird because I I often wonder what the hang-up is. If you think about the age that you started playing drums Mm -hmm. till when you became, like, relatively competent at drums, it was probably only a couple years, right? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so it's kind of like if you, <laughs> how old are you now? I'm 39. So if you would have started playing piano again at age like 36 and stuck with it for a few years, you might be competent right now. Like you might be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and I actually did. I went and took piano lessons again. Um, yeah, me when too. I, when I was 33. Yeah. And it was awesome. 
it was I was actually getting better and learning and um, and then and then I just stopped. I think the for me the challenge is as an adult I'm much harder on myself than I ever was as a kid. Yeah, I'm the same way. I also became way more interested in guitar and like oh piano is not as cool. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, there was that too and. Um, I don't know. It's hard to like, like you have a piano in your house. Um, I also like was moving around quite a bit. So yeah. having, having a piano around all the time was, wasn't really an option. I have a little Wurlitzer in my house, which is cool because they're actually fairly portable and, you know, aren't going to annoy everyone around, around you if you're banging around. All right. So going back, you were playing piano at around age seven mm -hmm. and you had three other siblings. Did, right. did your older siblings, like especially like the older brother that's in Seattle now, turn you guys on to cool music? Um, what he turned us on to was more like hip hop. Awesome. Like Run DMC and Beastie Boys. And that was all what was going on at that point. But that might have been even, that might have been a little bit later. Um, you remember when all of that was happening. Yeah, I'm only like a year younger than you, so yeah. I totally, re that, yeah, like 85, 84. Yeah. Um, and, and that was awesome, like Tribe Called Quest, mm -hmm. De La Soul. I think that was all kind of happening around the same time. Um, but he was also into kind of like the more, this much safer music, like MC Hammer. That. I I, I think I had an MC Hammer tape when mm. I was like nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm pretty sure I did too. Were your parents pretty religious people? They they were, and they they still are. Um, it it's actually been kind of a interesting, um, I don't know, kind of a a problem that is no longer a problem anymore in our family. So I was raised Mormon. Okay. Um, fairly, you know, strict Mormon family. Um, and my brother and I are the only ones who have left the faith. And um, Your brother, Rob. Rob, yeah. exactly. The, the, you know, the guys in the band, the rock and rollers. Yeah. Who, uh, <laughs> um, not the one with four kids. <laughs> not the one with four kids. Nope. Um, were your parents raised Mormon as well? They were. So we were born, all of us were born in Salt Lake City. And, oh, wow. Mm -hmm, and then moved out to Kansas when I was probably one or two. So definitely, like, the roots are in Utah. Mm -hmm. And they, they were both raised in Mormon families and... Um, that's it. We'd go out to Salt Lake City every summer to see the family, go back to Kansas, and that was kind of the routine. If Get Up Kids played in Salt Lake City on this tour, would you have a bunch of cousins coming out to the gig? So we are playing in Salt Lake City on this tour, and I'll probably have one or two cousins to come out. Um, we, we actually didn't do a very good job of staying connected with the family. Um, for whatever reason that is, the the family, my parents and all of us, when we moved out to Kansas, we, I don't know, we we did all of the traveling to go see the family, but we never really maintained a solid relationship for, I don't know, it's kind of depressing to say that, but it didn't didn't really stick. What would you say were the religious traditions that you enjoyed as a child? Um... Boy Scouts, even though that's not really religious, but the more kind of is, it felt like yeah. it. Um, but that was really great. Um, I I think that we got to like um, go every Sunday with my brothers and sister, and go and have this experience together that was whether you know, it was religious or not religious, we were all together and we were usually kind of like cracking each other up and screwing around and getting in trouble. Um, 
that was kind of fun. Was there a live band in church? There wasn't. That would have been great, but there was just the, the organ, the standard church organ. Anybody that's been on this show that kind of grew up in a tradition where there was like drums at church, uh-huh. most of them are an, an insane drummer. <laughs> yep, the ones who got to, got to play in church. Yeah, games. yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I did get to play drums in like church talent shows. That happened. Well, when was the first time you played drums? Um, the first time I played was in band. I was in... At school? I did the whole school band thing. So fifth grade? Um, I think I started in fourth grade. Oh, cool. Is where it started in my... What, where I grew up. Um, and right then, I got my bell set, my snare drum, you know, just like your standard starter kit for percussionist and... Um, that was the first time I got to hit, hit a drum. Do you feel like you connected to it in a way that piano didn't resonate with you? Like- um, absolutely. Um, I'm a very hyperactive child or, well, I still am a child, I guess, but <laughs> I, I, um, even just like sitting down and practicing scales for 20 minutes on a piano, um, I would kind of like lose my mind like oh I need to be like hitting something or tapping or beating on something so yeah I definitely like laid right into the the drum were you able to channel that energy and say sit down for 20 minutes and practice rudiments I was um that took a little bit more time because I I also couldn't get my um even though I wanted private lessons my parents wouldn't wouldn't pay for it um, because I was in school, in the school band, that should be enough. And there's other extracurricular activities that they would, would have rather I'd been doing. Like sports? Uh, p- probably like, like sports or, or, church, group. or church group stuff. Um, any of the things that I didn't want to do. Um, did you have faith in God at that time? Um, I, yeah, I probably did. Yeah, I think I did. Um, But I also didn't know any different at that time. Um, I think once puberty hit, everything started changing. (laughs) (laughs) Can you elaborate? (laughs) Meaning that that, um, I kind of like got outside of this small bubble that I existed in with with family and church and and new music was being, being, I was being exposed to new things and... um, meeting new people, just kind of like, you know, it's like when you go into the seventh grade. Yes. That's like, a, that was what happened when all of a sudden it all kind of changed for me. But I wonder if you've ever thought about that because like your older brother went through the seventh grade too and he's still with the church. Right. So what is it about like your experience and your, bro- and your brother Rob's experience do you think that diverged from that of your family? Um, th- yeah, yeah. That's it. Is it the music that I, took I, you to like? I think it's got to be the music, and also the the devil. <laughs> it's the devil. The, de- the devil exists in the music. Yeah. Um, I think also the um, wanting to e- explore the world a little bit more, like just get out and see it all, and also probably Did, girls didn't help. Yeah. I think that was also a a thing. Did you stick with the church long enough to do a ministry project? No. No. Okay. No. I was, I was the, um, you mean as far as like going on a mission? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, nope. My brother and I were the first ones to not do that. Was it painful to have a difference of opinion from your parents at the time? It was. It, it was a big problem for us, um, that I'm glad we've resolved at this point. That's great. It's really cool. Like we have a, we have a very, very close relationship, um, as close as we can without living in the same city. Um, but yeah, it was very, very difficult. Um, especially when we told them that we weren't going on our missions. We weren't, I wasn't going to go to college and we're going to play in a, in a punk rock band (laughs) and get in a van and drive around the the country making, you know, a hundred dollars. Yeah. And you guys started Get Up Kids in 94? Uh, 95. 95. So you were 16. I was 16. Yeah. And 
What inspired you to start the band? So um, I played in a high school band. Like, so right when I got a drum set, I was in a band that, that same year. It was, it was um, a terrible band. One of the older kids, like an 18-year-old guy from, that we knew from church, wanted to do um, like Stone Roses covers and Radiohead covers. Um, so Rob and I immediately got in a band with him and he kind of guided us and told us what to do. Um, and yeah, we were, we were terrible. But then right after that, we got a taste for being in a band and we started a, a band with Jim Subtick, who's also in the Get Up Kids, um, and called Kingpin. So we had this high school band and we were like the alternative punk rock kids who, you know, would play play at the like coffee shops or parties and and that was awesome were you writing your own songs yeah yet? we had we had like we actually just found out last night that a friend of ours has a found the demo of our 17 songs we recorded when we were you know 15 years old 14 15 i'm dying to hear that um, <laughs> and were you would you say that you were pretty driven to really go for it yeah, we were. We we even sent our demo, even like as a young high school band, to um, uh, Jay Jay Robbins, mm -hmm. and because we wanted to get on his record label, <laughs> Desoto, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We wanted to be on Desoto, and they responded, and we're and we're. It was crazy just just for us to be like, oh, people actually responded to our our little music in Olathe, Kansas. Um, so that was. Yeah, we were driven, but then our band broke up because, for whatever reason, it didn't. We all kind of, actually, Jim and I kind of butted heads a lot back then. Um, then the Get Up Kids started, and at first I wasn't even the drummer. I had another band called uh, Sky of Siam, this crazy like inspired by Hoover, Crown Hate Ruin, like Discord, all Discord. Yeah, second, kinda. or I guess that would be third wave Discord, the yeah. Erskine era. Big time, <laughs> yeah. Lungfish, all of that. Um, so I, I started playing with this band, who, which had members of um, Matt Pryor's previous band called Secular Theme, um, which was basically like a Nation of Ulysses kind of like, I don't know, that was their, their vibe. The suits, yes, the, the, whole, the look. <laughs> I can remember, like when I first started going on tour, which was just a couple years after that, like '97 ish. Uh, so many people were copying that particular era of mm -hmm. Discord bands. Mm -hmm. Either that, or I saw a lot of people copying the San Diego thing at the time. Oh yeah, too, with like all the black. black and then like <laughs> white belts, black dyed hair. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's a very specific thing, but then when I think about like the Kansas city scene at the time, th you know, there were people doing interesting things. There was shiner, e shiner, giant's chair, right? Giant's chair is great. Boy's life, mm -hmm. Brandon. Um, so that you guys kind of had a unique local scene yeah, that was getting agreed. known around the country too. Mm -hmm. Um, when did, when do you feel like you became comfortable as a musician, like comfortable as a drummer and confident? Um, probably not until really our third record as, as uh, the Get Up Kids, which would have been in 2002, 2001. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, our, one of our, actually our, very first U.S. tour, we went out with Braid, so I got to like watch Damon play drums every night, and I just felt awful about myself because I was <laughs> I was a pretty like sp spastic, chaotic drummer, sloppy. At least that's how I I felt, and um, he was very methodical and. Yeah, Damon is a very controlled pocket drummer yeah he is and i wasn't at that point it was more about just like pushing out as much noise as possible and hoping which it is all, cool too right and hoping it all lands in the right place um 
So that's how you felt at that point. And then what did it take for you to start feeling comfortable with your own way of playing? Um, so after we went on tour for Something to Write Home About, um, Rob and I decided we wanted to go to band camp. Um, we, we were like, for the first time we were making decent money as a musician. And then we... we um, we pretty much locked ourselves in his basement five days a week um, and just practiced, learned covers. Um, I, I learned how to play right-handed as opposed to left-handed, mm-hmm. which was very much like about gaining more confidence as a drummer because I was always the goofy kid who had to set up a ride cymbal way over here on the left, and I couldn't just sit down behind anyone's kit couldn't and play. Couldn't sit in. Yeah, I couldn't sit in, and it was really frustrating for me. And that, so once I was able to, to do that, go and just sit behind anyone's drum set and play, then I started to feel comfortable. This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. What was the impetus to create this DIY band camp? Um, we wanted to get better. We wanted to, we wanted to be like a really good rhythm section. And um, it, we, we didn't have to have any, have a job. I was 21. 21. Yeah. So 22. you already made it to a point where you didn't have to have a job at 21, 22. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty awesome. And you, and you were like, well, fuck now I might as well get good. Yeah. And so what kind of covers would you guys play? Uh, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, um, y- you know, kind of like standard. We did like Pink Floyd. Songs. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good like bass and drum kind of like pocket stuff, you know. So you would just lock yourself in Rob's basement and jam five days a week like it was a job. Yeah. Yeah. We were also writing a record at that time. So it all kind of played in together. Can you describe your relationship with Rob? Um, yeah, I think I could. Would you say that you're best friends? I, I think I would say that. And, and even beyond that, like best friends is... is is a uh, seems kind of like a an obvious one to me or easy reductive yeah i i think it's just like so how does it extend behind beyond that well kind of like um we would literally do anything for each other it it was kind of interesting cuz rob and i were on the exact felt like the exact same path like we did the same things went the same places lived in the same places we had the same jobs, all of these things throughout our entire lives until like, I guess, 2005 or six, once the, the Get Up Kids took a break or broke up, um, then they kind of like split off. And that's been interesting too. Yeah. How have you evolved as a person since 2006? I think I've learned a lot about life and have figured out you know, there's still a lot more to go, but I've, I've got a better viewpoint on, um, not just being in the small bubble, which is yourself. Like all I know, all I knew back like then was I'm in a band. I play in this band and this is what I do. I'm a drummer in a band and we tour all the time and I come home and I, you know, hang out with my friends and do this or that and then I go and do that again yeah so it was kind of like a do, doing this for such a such a what long time and then it just stopping right I think it was it was a hard pill to swallow but I think it was a really good one 
basically like coming to terms with your identity beyond just that of a band guy. Absolutely. Cause it, it, it's a, it, it shouldn't just be that, that gets pretty, it's pretty, um, pretty boring. <laughs> yeah. It's the same cycle over and over. Mm hmm. So I got, I got into all kinds of other things after that. Um, like small business kind of stuff and also playing music, um, just for fun instead of like as a job I think is pretty cool which I I um I need to do more of that I need to do more <laughs> of that too yeah just like oh yeah this is just what we do mm-hmm. instead of um everything having to be calculated well I I mean the problem that I run into is that sometimes I feel disconnected from that initial joy that I felt playing music if I'm working if I'm doing it for work, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's more difficult for me to connect. I have to, I have to like work harder to connect with that feeling of joy. If I'm getting paid to do it for some reason, right. <laughs> Which seems counterintuitive, but if, if I'm thinking about it as a job, then it's less fun. So I have to think about it like, Oh, I get to do this. Yeah. I am the same way. Um, it's also pretty cool when you can sit back and think about, oh, wait, I'm actually getting paid to do something that I love to do. Yeah. That's, that's like, I try and keep that always in the back of my head when you start to get down on whatever situation you're in. It's like, oh, wait, I'm still getting paid to play music. Yeah. And travel around the world. That's insane. Yeah. Well, tell me about the small business enterprises that you've entered into over the last 10, 12 years. So we, um, as a band, um, the Ghetto Kids, we bought a recording studio in 2000, I think 2002, called the Black Lodge. And um, that, was, that was fun. We did that to, in order to go make a record there. Um, instead of like spending a ton of money to go record somewhere else. Right. So you had, uh, at that point, you, you, in 2002, you could still get a pretty decent budget to make a record. So yeah, you that, just took that and invested it in your own gear. Exactly. Yeah, back then, back when budgets were a little bit higher than now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and studios actually uh, could charge money. Yeah. Um, so we, we did that. Um, after the band broke up, my brother and I bought the studio from the other guys with our partner, Ed Rose. Um, so after that, I just ran the studio, and we kept that going. Um, it was great. In this small town called Eudora, um, we had bands from all over the world coming to stay there. Had a cool apartment where people could stay while they recorded. and um, So I ran that. Um, then we bought our favorite bar and coffee shop called the Bourgeois Pig in 2007 and kept that thing going. Not to be confused with the Bourgeois Pig in in, LA, in Hollywood. Not at all. Or in Chicago. And uh, how did you know how to run it? Well, I I didn't. (laughs) And that was was kind of the exciting part about it. But what I did know how to do was was run a small business. Um, Just not dealing with as many people. So that was the challenge with that. Um, you know, just, just humans, you know, trying to read people and keep everything cool and do a, you know, be a good, keep people in mind, but make them feel valued at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Be a good listener and, um, make sure that, yeah, everyone's happy. Um, that was, that was a learning process which is still going on um but that's what we we did that for a while we also had a this pretty cool little uh like well it's not little anymore but a merchandise company called blue collar distro and press we kind of started that in um in eudora also around that same time um and then you make merch for for other bands correct Mm mm-hmm and do you do fulfillment from there as well? We do. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So maybe I should talk to you about making trap set apparel. <laughs> we we can do all of those things. Oh, um, great. To uh, my brother and I were involved with that, and we actually are not anymore. Uh, got it. But okay. we're we're all still very good friends. It's actually the 
Sean, the singer of Coalesce. Do you oh, remember, yes, remember of course, I remember them. Yeah, so he's the, the, I guess, the, the president of that company. I think it's so interesting that um, so many of the people I know that I played in the DIY scene uh-huh. with in the 90s have gone on to start businesses. And yeah. it makes a lot of sense. It does, doesn't it? You have to be enterprising to you know book tours and go out on the road and you i feel like lots of those lessons that you learn can be applied to business Mm -hmm. and as it turns out there's generally more of a market for say a bar or a coffee shop or uh, you know a merch company than there is for weird music that people were making so like (laughs) it's almost like you're handicapping yourself when you're playing weirdo music that most people will never like (laughs) that's that's true I I also think there's a point where if you if you didn't work for someone or didn't have to like have a boss, um, then uh, some people just don't want to ever really have a boss. Yeah, and they have to find ways to um, figure that out on their own. Mm-hmm. Like, so I don't know. I guess that's been my thing. And then now you have your own coffee roasting company. Yeah. What's that called? It's called Repetition Coffee. And you started it with your wife? Yep. We started that about three years ago. And that's, that's the, new, the new project that's fresh and exciting. Are you pretty good at managing your time so that you're making enough time to play drums, run a coffee business, run a bar? Like, how do you organize your day? I'm, I'm so unorganized, which... I, that seems a little bit hard to believe, given all of these things that you've done. Well, I get I get it done, but I do things very chaotically. Yeah. Um, I I'm able to somehow pull it all off. Um, it's not always pretty, but I can get it done. Um, I have to definitely credit my wife for helping me keep things in order so I don't completely drop the ball on important things in my life. Um, but I don't know. I, uh, I'm, I have a lot of energy, I think is really what it comes down to. Today's episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Tackle Instrument Supply Company, manufacturers of exceptionally high-quality instrument bags crafted from canvas and leather. Tackle sent me some of their snare drum, stick, and cymbal bags, and they are, in my opinion, the most beautiful and elegantly functional instrument bags on the market. Explore their entire range of products at tackleinstrument.com. Do you feel like you still have the same amount of energy you did when you were starting out in the Get Up Kids? Um, yeah, I think I do. Now, when I say that, I, I'm talking more like in general yes. as a human. Um, I don't think I have as much energy as drumming. As much physical energy. No, not at all. That's like a, a thing that you know, you can start to feel, I'm sure all drummers can relate to that as you get a little bit older. Yeah. Well, I feel like I just have to work harder to make sure that my body is in shape. Right. Um, I'm totally with you. What, what do you do? I do pull-ups and push-ups and jump rope and stuff. Nice. Yeah. Kind of like a boxer's routine. Yeah. What do you do? So I just got really into cycling. Oh, awesome. That's my, my new thing. Um, like long distance cycling. I love that too, especially in like the Midwest Mm -hmm. where I come from Milwaukee. Like I could ride my bike to Madison and back, but out here there are definitely great places where you can go cycling. But since I live in downtown LA, there's no way I'm riding my bike around. Yeah. That sounds dangerous. No way. (laughs) Yeah. Especially with everybody on their phones now. Yeah. As they're driving cars. Yeah. That's scary. No. Um, (laughs) Yes. So where I'm living, you can, 
there's plenty of cycling to do. Did you ever think about leaving uh, Kansas? Yeah, I, you know, I actually have um, left Kansas. I lived in L.A. for one year. Oh, you did? Uh-huh, in uh, 1999. And what brought you back to Kansas? Um, so I basically moved here for a girl, go figure, and um, I had a really nice year. wasn't here like a ton of, ton of it because we were working a lot. Um, touring, but um, moved up to Santa Cruz with her as well. Um, I was really like jealous because all of the band was all living in one place, and I started to feel disconnected from what was happening, um, including like writing or just hanging out, really. Because at that point, we were thick as thieves. We were really like a band, you know. Um, I broke up with this girl because almost because of that and packed all my stuff in a van and drove back to Kansas in probably like 2001. And what was the inspiration to get the band back together on this current run? Um, I, th this particular run that we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, we had been trying to get together and write music for a really long time and we finally did, and we went, we went in the studio, knocked out these four songs, and kind of like sat back. Then we went back and listened to it, and we were, we were all pretty happy about what, what we did. And it kind of like reinvigorated the band and got everyone excited about it. Um, so I think that was kind of the, the kickoff. Then we, we, um, we just kept writing. And it's, it's almost like once the, uh, the fountain was turned on, it, it just, it's on. So we wanted to try and celebrate that or keep it going. I also wonder if the fact that everybody, yourself included, has kept so busy and kind of expanded into all these other projects uh -huh. makes it easier to be in the band because now that's not your only identity and you not everything not all creative fulfillment has to come from the band right so not needing it for everything often makes it easier for the flow to happen i totally agree i, I know i can talk for me that's how i feel um i can't talk about the other guys mm -hmm. but um yeah absolutely um i would i think be pretty pretty like bored if all i did was like play in one band you know i need to do more and now you guys are, it's, it's almost come full circle because earlier you were talking about the first tour you did with Braid mm -hmm. and Braid was on Polyvinyl and now you guys have signed with Polyvinyl right. um, and you have a new album. We have a new album. How would you say that the process has differed from previous albums? Um, for, for this one, we, I think we, we tried to keep it as live as possible and a little rougher around the edges, um, which is where our band is usually excelled, just letting it, letting it hang out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the, uh, that would be the, the bigger difference compared to like our previous albums, which some of which were very like slick or clean and actually some don't sound very good at all um because the energy got sucked out the energy got sucked out yeah i can definitely go back and hear where me as a drummer or the whole band is just like it's like someone's just like holding on to our our shirt like holding us back it's right like, it's like, like white flower all the germ is gone. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. It's got to be got to be rough a little bit. Well, what are your ambitions for the future, creatively? Um, as far as um, with with drumming, with everything, with life. Yeah, because it seems like you've done all these other projects and mm -hmm. drumming, and they're kind of all coming from the same well. So, right. What do you want to try that you haven't tried so far? Um, I. I really want to expand on the our coffee business. I think that there's some really fun stuff we could do with that, including 
I mean, just being able to like travel to these coffee growing countries and meet producers and um, working with, with importers all over the world, that's really exciting to me. And um, we've made some really close connections through that, that process. Um, so I want to keep, keep working on that. Um, as far as drumming, I want to, uh, I want to make a really, really great record. That's where, where all of our heads are at right now with this band. Cause we, we go into the studio in September to record with, uh, Peter Cadis, which I'm really excited about. How did you dis- how did you arrive at Peter? So he engineered a record that we did um, in two thousand two on a wire, and um, none of us were really that happy with how it sounded, including him. So it's almost like he we've stayed in touch with him, and he's continued to like make killer records and become you know really successful at what he does. Um, so. We're kind of like going back in time, like almost like a, a, we're going to live in this house we lived in in 2002. We're going to record in the exact same studio and make a brand new record with this guy. That's amazing. Yeah. Sounds fun. So what is it, how would you characterize or or what does making a great record mean to you at this point? Uh, For me, it means that I can go and listen to it 10 years from now and still um, feel something, feel feel happy and calm, mm-hmm. like proud of it. Um, yeah, I think time is the only thing that really allows that to show itself. You know, what's interesting is there are some things that I've done that at the time I was really upset with or didn't feel like was all that great. And then 10 years later, it sounds much better than I remembered. Uh-huh. And then the opposite also, like yep. things that I thought sounded great at the time and then I listened back and I'm not as happy with it. So it's almost like I'd... <laughs> I've learned not to trust myself <laughs> when mm-hmm. it comes to my own stuff. Yeah. And to try to just like do the best I can and then move on. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's very, that's good advice. Support for the trap set comes from Polyvinyl Records. Earlier this year, Polyvinyl signed The Get Up Kids, featuring this week's guest, Ryan Pope, and released the band's new Kicker EP in June. Kicker is The Get Up Kids' first new music in seven years and went on to receive multiple accolades from the likes of Pitchfork, Spin, The Fader, and more. For a limited time, head on over to polyvinylrecords.com and enter coupon code TRAPSET at checkout to receive 15% off the album and related merchandise. What do you think is the through line that has enabled you to be successful in all of these seemingly disparate uh, endeavors? You know, making coffee, playing drums, making albums, running a recording studio, running a merch business. I feel like I'm pretty good at at bringing people together. I think that's that's something I have. Um, Now... Keeping them together, maybe not not the, <laughs> not the best at that, but um, I don't know. I I I think it's kind of uh, a, a a gift I have. Um, so, however that works, um, to make things successful or not, um, I, I don't know. I think that's that's. I would go with that. And do you have kids yet? No, I don't. Do you want them? I think I do want kids. Um, it's definitely like been on my mind a lot more lately because everyone around me has babies. Yes. Um, I'm sure you know all about it. Yes. Um, when we're at that age where yeah. it's kind of like, well, if you're going to do it, now's, now's the time to do it. The whole reason I started this podcast is because I was dating someone at the time that really wanted to have a kid. Yeah. And I wasn't sure about it yet. And one night, 
I kind of got drunk with Brendan Canty, who ended yeah. up being the very first guest on this show. Who is one of my favorite drummers in the entire world. Yeah, and just one of the best people. But also, he has like a million kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, I don't even understand how you do what you do. Like, tell me, how, you, how do you have all these kids and you're a badass on drums, a badass composer. Yeah, you have all of it. Like, tell me. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of the origin of the of the podcast. Right, like <laughs> trying to unlock the secret. I was, well, yeah, and I, I feel like basically his advice was just like, get the right partner mm-hmm. and then just go for it and don't think about it. And I'll never forget that he told me the way that he was raised his term for it was benign neglect. Like his parents had all these kids, they were Irish Catholic, and then they just bought a bunch of really cool books and interesting things for the kids to check out and just let them do their thing. I think that's so counter to the way that lots of people raise their kids nowadays where everything has to be managed and like curated. And Yeah, it's like the, the tailored childhood. That scares me because I wouldn't ever want to have been raised that way. Yeah, and it just seems like the culture has shifted, especially in this town. So, I don't mm-hmm. know. So, does that mean you're rethinking it? Well, now I'm. Well, so I'm not with the same person that I was with when I started it. But right. um, that will change things. But I think I have the right person now. Cool. Uh, and she's also younger, so I, I'm not in as much of a rush. Mm-hmm. But it's also like, do you want to be the 50 year old dad playing cash? <laughs> like, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I would like to be still in shape when I'm 50, but yeah, I, I don't know. Me too. I, I do think there's something to when I see some of my friends that had kids, you know, when we were all 21, mm-hmm. and now their kids are almost ready to go to college. I'm like, oh, they already got it out of the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But then I think about the wealth of experience that I had going on tour and doing all these things that I wouldn't have done if I had had people that I was responsible for. Agreed. Um, yeah. You have to make harder decisions. But I will say the other person that comes to mind is um, I had Mimi from the band Low, and they're they're Mormon, um, and they had kids, and they made it work with touring and doing it all. So, I, I mean, you can do it. I've seen it happen. Yeah, you can. Um <laughs> If you if you're a good person and you are a hard worker, there's a way to make it happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm, I mean, Matt, the singer of of uh, our band, he has three kids, and somehow is just keeps keeps touring. I don't, you know, it happens. Yeah. Well, maybe in another ten years, right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe in another ten years. <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>